If you were trapped in a real life horror movie and hunted down by a family of zombies, what would you do? Every movie villain is waiting to be unleashed and there's nothing you can do to stop them. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the horrifying monsters in the cabin in the woods. These students are about to destroy the entire world. They're driving out to their friend's cabin for a trip, but when Jules here checks the GPS for directions, she discovers the house doesn't exist on the map. It's strange, but they shrug it off as Marty here explains that going off the grid is actually a good thing. Nobody will be able to find them, and that means they're free to party as hard as they want. But he doesn't realize that this is going to backfire. Driving deeper into the wilderness, the group finally arrives at their destination, and they all get out of the camper to see the cabin. It's older than they expected, but when they open the door to look inside, they find the interior has been completely renovated. Moving into his room, Holden here gets himself settled and puts his stuff down when he notices something disturbing. On the dresser is a painting of hunters butchering a sheep, and horrified, the man decides to take it down. Looking back at the wall, he's surprised to see a window that peeks straight into Dana's room, but she doesn't notice him at all. It's a one-way mirror, and he's got a front row seat to see her undress. Conflicted, Holden feels too guilty to keep watching and slaps the wall, getting her to stop. He gathers the others to show them the transparent mirror, and they can't believe a place like this would have one. Curtis here suggests they should check the other rooms too, and the rest of them leave, but Dana here stays behind. Seeing how nervous the girl is, Holden offers to switch rooms with her, and she gladly accepts the deal. The man packs his things and leaves her alone in the room, but as Dana here starts to cover the mirror with a blanket, she's got no idea that she's still being watched. Okay, nothing about this is a good idea. Going on vacation with the God of Thunder is bound to be an epic weekend, but there were too many signs that should have told them to stay home. First of all, this group discovered that their destination is not even mapped by satellites, and that's not as normal as you might think. If there's no GPS data of this area, then it either doesn't have a registered address, is built in a place that's too remote, or someone requested that the satellite information be removed. The good thing is, we actually know enough to deduce which of these reasons is most likely. Now, judging from the time of day, this road trip couldn't have taken longer than 4-5 to five hours, which means they probably traveled less than 200 miles. If they managed to get there in this old RV, then the cabin is accessible enough to be mapped by GPS, so that can't be the reason. Secondly, the group actually stopped for gas on the way, where this man here told them that the house was called the Buckner Place, and it's been sold to a lot of previous owners before them. If the place has been listed for sale, then it definitely would have a registered address. That leaves us with the most likely option that this cabin was intentionally removed from satellite mapping, which is sketchy as hell. And when you combine that with what we've discovered inside, it's not surprising. When this guy took down the painting, he found a one-way mirror, which has absolutely no business being here. But the freaky thing is, the wooden frame looks a lot newer than the rest of the wall. Someone had this recently installed, and that makes this so much creepier. Now, if we have good reason to believe that this place has been removed from satellite mapping, then the mirror might be used for interrogation or execution. If I were in this situation, I would be really suspicious of Thor here, because the cabin actually belongs to his cousin. Since his family owns the place, then Curtis here probably knew all about the mirror. Already, the signs point to some seriously f***ed up things happening in this house, and I would go looking around for other clues that help confirm my suspicions. If I find weird things like cameras or bloodied weapons, then I'd quietly round up the friends I trust and drive off with the RV before anything bad happens. Meanwhile, inside a massive surveillance room, someone is spying on the students, and they have no idea that there are dozens of hidden cameras throughout the entire cabin. That's when the scientist comes walking in and asks the man for approval to drug the blonde woman and increase her libido. She explains that they've secretly laced the blonde's hair dye with a chemical that lowers her IQ, and it will help make sure that every single student dies tonight. It's the perfect setup, and everything is going according to their secret plan. That night, the group throws a party and they're all having a good time, when Marty here decides they should all play truth or dare. The redhead chooses to take a dare, but all of a sudden a floor hatch pops open behind them. The group walks over to it, curious to know what's going on, and they all go down to check it out. Marty here lights a lantern to illuminate the room, and the group is weirded out by the massive collection of strange antiques left behind. That's when Dana here finds a diary belonging to Anna Buckner, whose family used to live in this cabin. Skimming through it, she reads out the final entry that says, whoever recites the Latin phrases written on the page will restore the dead. Marty here warns her not to do that, but he suddenly hears a voice insist she reads the phrases aloud. He's the only one who notices, and the girl recites the words, sealing their fate. 
in the forest, a hand bursts out of the ground as the Buckner family rises from the grave, and these zombies are out for blood. Okay, everything about this was a bad idea. These students had plenty of signs to tell them that something is wrong here, but they're ignoring all of them. First of all, there's no natural reason that it would swing open with this much force all on its own. Curtis here suggests that the wind must have blown it open, but this door leads to the basement, which is completely sealed off from the outside, so this wouldn't make any sense. For a normal door, it would take an 80 km per minute wind to burst open like this, but outside, there's barely even a light breeze. Now, what's worrying about this is that these aren't just a bunch of dumb kids, because earlier, this girl wanted to pack her book on the aftermath of the cultural political climate for fun reading. These are intelligent students, but there's no evidence of critical thinking in this group at all except for Marty, and it's a clear sign that something is really wrong here. Now, as for the objects in this basement, there's no way of knowing that all these items are cursed. But if there was one thing we can be pretty confident about, it's that you should never read a spell out loud. Latin is a dead language, but one of the ways it's still used today are in religious incantations as well as the occult. And if you've seen any horror movie ever, reading something in Latin is going to seriously ruin your day. If there was any sign that occult rituals were being practiced in this house, we should leave immediately. Now, one of the easiest ways to figure this out is by how the basement might smell. For centuries, witches have used herbs to make potions to protect themselves from demons and cast spells on people. If there are any herbs like St. John's Wort or Sage placed on the cabin's window sills, then there's a good chance that the previous owners of the house were practicing witchcraft. These are very recognizable fragrances for dark rituals, and if the students saw any one of these signs, it wouldn't take long for them to realize that they should leave this place immediately. Now, not all fragrances are meant for evil, but the only way you're going to find the ones that won't get you killed is if you use Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription that allows you to custom order a deluxe sample from over 600 brands and get it delivered to your doorstep. They have perfumes and colognes perfect for anyone and any occasion. Every month, you can pick out what you really want to receive so there are no surprises and get to choose from designer fragrances like Arquiste, Michel Germain, Mercedes-Benz, Prada, Gucci, Versace, and more. You'll get a 30-day supply of a travel-sized vial of fragrance to try before committing to a full bottle. With Scentbird, you can get a small collection of high-end fragrances for just $16. With my code, it will be only $11 for your first month. It's easy to sign up, and Scentbird will guide you through a quiz to help you find your perfect match and provide descriptions of fragrance classifications and notes. That way your perfume doesn't end up in a graveyard of rejected and unused bottles like this one. Simply choose a 3, 6, or 12-month gift subscription, and Scentbird will send it directly to your recipient's email with the choice to skip any month for free. And since it's near the holiday season, it's a great gift option. Check out Scentbird's perfume and cologne gift sets filled with fan-favorite scents and designer names you know and love for a fraction of the price. The products keep coming month after month, and now Scentbird is available in Canada. But why not treat yourself too? Click the link in the description and use my coupon code for 30% off your first month at Scentbird. Thank you, Scentbird, for sponsoring this video. The students go back upstairs to hang out, but the blonde starts flirting with the stoner, which is something she would never do. It's suspicious, and he tells them he thinks there's something wrong with everyone, but nobody believes him. Getting aroused, Curtis here decides to ditch the group for some alone time with his girlfriend. Leading her to the door, he tells the stoner to share his theory with the others while he gets laid. But this just confirms to Marty that there's more to this cabin than they realize, and he's completely right. Later, the boyfriend and the blonde are out in the forest, but they have no idea that a team of supervisors are watching their every move and are ready for the next step of their evil plan. They release a chemical mist of pheromones, and the two college students decide to do it right there on the forest floor. They start making out, when a knife suddenly comes out of nowhere and pierces straight through the girl's hand. She screams in pain, startling her boyfriend, as they look up to realize they've just been attacked by a zombie. The boyfriend tackles the monster and knocks it to the ground. Worried, he runs over to his girlfriend to check on her, but another creature attacks him from behind. He fights out the zombie and pulls a garden shear out of his back, but then a third monster walks into view. This giant creature swings a bear trap at the boyfriend and hits him in the head, knocking the man out. Panicking, the girlfriend tries running past the zombie, but it catches her with a bear trap and pulls the woman towards him. The creature picks her up, and she can do nothing as the monsters hold a hacksaw to her neck, forcing her boyfriend to watch as they kill her. That's one sacrifice down, with four more to go. 
Okay, this was a horrible way to die, but we have to cut these guys a little slack here. None of them are making good choices tonight, but it's because they're being controlled by these supervisors who masterminded this entire situation. Somehow, they lured them all the way up to this isolated cabin, and it's probably the reason these students couldn't get their GPS working on the drive here. Then, they infused the girl's blonde hair dye with chemicals that lowered her ability to think for herself. They literally turned this A-plus student into a dumb blonde, and with all this working against them, there's not a lot they can do to outsmart the situation. For perspective, we can see here on his monitor that the temperature of the forest is 64 degrees. But look at what this girl is wearing. These clothes are not enough to keep her warm in this climate, but instead of asking for her boyfriend's jacket, she's taking more of her clothes off. If the mist of pheromones has compromised our thinking to the point that we can't even tell how cold we are, then this is not a fair fight. And we're going to need to use the most basic survival tools we have if we want to get out of this alive. In a life or death situation, your body experiences what is known as the fight, flight, or freeze response. And it's our go-to biological defense mechanism even for the stupidest of people. Now, Curtis used these instincts to fight, which was not the right decision, but there's one saving grace here, because they revealed a key strategy in beating them. He's proven that these creatures can be knocked over easily by running into them, but the most important observation is that they took forever to get back up. When this third zombie came out to attack them, the other two zombies that Curtis knocked down were nowhere to be seen for over 30 seconds. These guys are slow as hell, and it tells us that once they're on the ground, we'll have plenty of time to run away. Now we also have enough information to suggest that these creatures aren't smart enough to plan an ambush, because if they were, they would have realized that it would have given them the clear advantage. The fact that they came out one at a time means they're pretty dumb, and since we're still being affected by the chemicals, that makes this a level playing field. The good news is, we don't have to overthink the situation in order to escape. Of these three zombie brothers, the most dangerous is this guy with the chain because it's a ranged weapon, but his weakness is that he needs to reel it back in to recast it. All we would need to do is evade his attack once by hiding behind a tree, and when he's reeling it back in, we run straight for him and knock the guy over just like the other two. Even though these supervisors have lowered our IQs, our basic survival instinct should be enough to get us out of here alive if we use the zombie's weaknesses against them. At the cabin, Marty decides to go out for a walk, but when he looks up to the sky, he notices that there aren't any stars. The man interprets it as a sign that something bad is going to happen and never notices a zombie sneaking up behind him. That's when the boyfriend bumps into Marty, telling him to get back indoors, and they both run for the cabin, knocking the zombie to the ground. Inside, the others check on Curtis here, asking him where his girlfriend went, and the man tells them she's gone. He knows they need to leave if they want to survive, but the redhead insists they need to find their friend first, and opens the door, revealing a giant zombie standing outside. The group stares in shock at the monster, and it suddenly throws something into the redhead's arms. Catching it, she realizes it's the blonde woman's head, and screams in terror before the others run for the door and lock it shut, keeping the monster from getting into the cabin. Everyone is terrified, and Curtis tells them they need to barricade all the entryways into the cabin and stick together to stay safe, but the supervisors have other plans. One of them presses a button and releases pheromones into the cabin as Curtis here walks right into their trap. Turning around, he tells the others that he's changed his mind, insisting they should split up to cover more ground, and the group agrees with his terrible new plan. Suddenly, a zombie punches through the wall behind them, and the man goes to fight the creature off while the others run back into their rooms, with no idea they're about to be trapped inside. Marty quickly closes the window and knocks over a lamp, but then he notices something strange. Inspecting the light, he discovers a tiny spy camera and realizes someone has been watching them. The stoner thinks he must be on a reality TV show, when a monster suddenly grabs him through the window. He desperately reaches for something to protect himself, but gets dragged outside and thrown to the ground. Getting back to his feet, he tries to run away, but the zombie throws its knife straight into his back, knocking him to the ground. Marty can't do anything as the monster grabs him from behind and drags the man into its grave. That's two sacrifices down, with three more to go. Okay, this is getting bad. Marty was the only student to realize that they're being watched with cameras, and that information could have been extremely useful to the rest of the group. This would have helped them realize that whatever is going on in this cabin, they've been trapped here for someone's entertainment, and this would give them more strategies to work with in how they beat the scenario. Instead of only thinking about beating the monsters, we would be able to expand our tactics to fight against whoever's watching us and destroy all the cameras we can find. This would force the supervisors to respond in real time, and the more we interfere with their plans, the more they'll have to adapt to the situation. Forcing your enemy to think on the fly is going to make it easier for them to make a mistake, and this might give us more opportunities to escape. 
Now, as dangerous as these monsters are, the biggest threat to the students are these pheromone traps. Curtis had a great idea to stick together and barricade the entrances, and it's definitely the smartest thing to do. These monsters are slow, which means we should have enough time to organize ourselves, and there's enough furniture in this cabin to prop against the windows and doors. As far as we know, there are only 5 zombies to kill, and since we have a weapon, this is definitely a beatable scenario under normal circumstances. The problem is that with the press of a single button, the supervisors were able to change Curtis's mind and completely destroy his strategy. There are probably hidden vents everywhere throughout the building, and since these pheromones are odorless, nobody seems to realize that it's even there. This is a huge weakness, and we have to work with a lowered IQ until we can get out of this cabin. Now, all of these students have decided it's best to split up and go to their rooms, but one of the most effective low IQ survival strategies we have is cowardice. When you put your own life before everyone else's, it makes your decision making a lot easier because you don't have to weigh your options. We don't have to outsmart the situation as long as we have a meat shield at our disposal. So with this in mind, I would agree with the plan, but follow either Holden or Curtis into their room and refuse to leave. If a zombie comes to attack us, then they can do all the work trying to stop it, and this gives me a higher chance of surviving without even having to use my brain. In Dana's room, a monster starts breaking through the window and the girl backs away in terror. That's when her friend Holden smashes the one-way mirror open and she climbs through to the other side, falling on the floor. Together, the two survivors move his bed and block the hole in the glass frame, discovering a trap door that was hidden underneath it. Dana here decides to open it up and finds out it leads to the basement. Lowering a lamp through the hatch, they see there's nothing waiting for them and jump down to safety. The girl shines the light around the room and finds a collection of tools on a table. That's when she remembers the diary and realizes this is the same room where the Buckner family was murdered. Dana is terrified that they'll be killed here too, but her friend reassures her they'll survive and tells the girl to look for an exit. Suddenly, a bear trap swings into his back, tearing it open, and he gets yanked into the hatch by a zombie. The girl runs in to save him and pulls him down to the floor, leaving the zombie hanging halfway through the door. Grabbing a crowbar, she jams it straight into the monster's face, successfully killing it. With the zombie now dead, Dana has interfered with the supervisor's plan, and one of them presses a button that electrifies the knife, making the girl drop it. That's when Curtis runs through the doors behind them, telling his friends to follow him out of the basement. The group leaves the cellar, and they all run for the camper van, hoping to make their escape. The survivors get inside, but have no idea that their plan is about to fall apart. They drive through the tunnel trying to make their escape, but that's when the cave suddenly explodes and the rock walls start collapsing. Panicking, the group reverses the RV and backs out at full speed, narrowly avoiding being crushed under the debris. The students stare at the tunnel in shock, realizing that their only way out of here has been closed off forever. The friends regroup near this ravine, where they can see another cliff on the other side, and Curtis here thinks he might be able to jump it. Revving up the dirt bike they brought with them, he reassures the others that he'll get help and prepares to cross the gap. The man drives off the ravine, and it looks like he might make it, but he suddenly crashes into an invisible force field. His body is sent tumbling into the cliffs below, and that's now three sacrifices down, with two more to go. Okay, this is completely unfair. They finally escaped the cabin, which means that they aren't under the influence of pheromones anymore, and finally had the freedom to think clearly about this horrifying scenario. Curtis was confident that he would be able to jump across the canyon, and he actually looked like he was going to make it, but this was still a horrible idea. If we look at this realistically, the distance between the two sides looked like it might be close to 10 RVs across. And since the average camper is around 30 feet long, that could mean the gap is about 330 feet. Now, as scary as that sounds, it's not an impossible feat. In 2008, Australian motorcyclist Robbie Madison managed to jump a gap of 351 feet, but that was with the help of a massive ramp to gain airtime and a specialized bike, not to mention years of professional training. For this to even be possible, Curtis here would have needed to be going over 90 miles per hour off of a ramp at least 30 feet tall, with plenty of room on the other side to slow down. Now, calculating the projectile motion of an object is not easy, because there are so many different variables at work. But you don't have to be a genius mathematician to figure out that no matter how you look at this, it's guaranteed to end very badly for him. In the meantime, the rest of us should try to climb up the side of the mountain above the tunnel, and we can see here that there might be a place to find a path over. Even in the worst case scenario, we will just find that the force field blocks our path and we'll have to climb back down with more information than before. Now this stunt clearly didn't work, and their only other idea was to head back to the cabin, but there was still a great way they could have escaped using this strategy. If there's one thing you can count on, it's that this family of zombies will continue to follow you wherever you go until you're dead. 
With that in mind, the smartest decision might be to just wait for them to appear and run them down with the camper van. These creatures are undead, so we might never be able to kill them, but running them over would maim their bodies to the point that there would be no way for them to continue haunting us. Knowing your horror movie tropes is going to be a real lifesaver here, because a strategy like this can work if you know how different types of monsters will behave, and that information helps us develop the correct strategy to take them out. Dana figured this out by accident, because she stabbed the zombie in the face and it stopped moving completely. What she didn't seem to notice though, was that the supervisors electrified the knife and removed it from her hands. For some reason, she didn't register that this happened, but it likely means that anything we take from this cabin can't be trusted because it can be sabotaged whenever we need it most. This is all the more reason that instead of fighting back with knives and coffee mugs, if we arm ourselves with a 10-ton camper and collection of horror movie tropes, we just might have a chance at getting out of this alive. With no other choice, the survivors get into the RV and head back to the cabin. Holden here thinks they might be able to find another way out, but the girl argues that it's hopeless. Suddenly, a massive knife bursts out of the man's throat, and Dana is horrified to see that a zombie has snuck inside the vehicle. That's four sacrifices down, with only one more to go. Her friend falls into the steering wheel dead, and the camper van crashes into a lake. They sink into the water, but she manages to escape the RV, making her the last remaining survivor. Dana pulls herself out of the water and collapses onto the pier, but just as she thinks she's safe, the giant zombie steps onto the other end of the dock, and the monster walks over to her fully intent on getting its revenge. The creature swings his bear trap into the air to kill the girl, but the chain suddenly gets caught. Marty is still alive, and he pulls the monster back, rescuing Dana at the last second. Both survivors are relieved to see each other, but the zombie isn't done with them yet. The girl rips out a wooden board and hits the creature, knocking it into the water. Their friends quickly run into the forest, with Marty leading them back towards the cabin. He opens up a hidden trap door he found, and the survivors go through, but they'll soon discover the horrifying truth about why they were brought here. Inside, the woman is startled when a hand taps her foot, and she sees the zombie that attacked Marty on the ground, chopped into pieces. He opens a hidden panel on the floor, revealing an elevator, and tells her the zombies were sent to attack them, but they can ride it back to escape. With no good options left, the redhead drops down inside, and Marty tampers with the fuse box, jump-starting the elevator. It takes them deeper underground, but suddenly comes to a stop. That's when the man turns around to see a ballerina trapped inside of a glass box, and finds that her entire face is one giant mouth. Behind them, a man steps forward with saw blades sticking out of his face, and he's holding a strange puzzle, just like the one they found in the basement. That's when the woman realizes they chose how they would die, and this was a trap all along. Angry, the girl starts hitting the glass wall, surrounded by a collection of the most terrifying monsters, and they're all about to be set free. Okay, this is terrifying. Being hunted by a family of zombies is one thing, but discovering an entire army of monsters underground is something else entirely. Now the good news is that for the moment, we are trapped in a glass box, which means we're safe. But it was definitely a mistake coming down here in the first place. Logically, if we already know that the environment was designed to kill us, then whatever we think we're going to find waiting for us below is not going to help us survive. It's walking right into the lines then, and it only means there will be more ways for the supervisors to control our movements. If it were me, I would block these entrances so that more monsters wouldn't be able to come up, and we can continue trying to find ways to escape the force field. It's important to realize that we were still able to enter the area, even though the force field was active during the day. There also isn't any curvature in this wall either, which means it's not a dome. That's an extremely important observation, because it means that there still might be a way to call for help. Before risking my life in this death trap, I would use their own environment against them and start burning down the cabin. We already know that there's a lantern in the house, and since this place is made out of wood, it should be able to catch fire without too much difficulty. The smoke will rise into the air, and judging from the scenery, it's very likely that we're close to a national park, which would have rangers and possibly even watchtowers to keep an eye out. If we can build a fire for the smoke to alert anyone nearby, it might be enough to get the authorities to investigate the fire and send help. Even though the tunnel has collapsed, it's not uncommon to have helicopters dispatched to access difficult to reach areas. The other advantage is that all the antiques in the basement will be destroyed, which means there would be no possible way to summon any additional monsters by accident. Now, the truth is, starting a fire wouldn't just alert people from the outside, but it would also alert the supervisors who are controlling the place. This would completely destroy their plans, and it might even be enough to send someone up to assess the situation or clean up pieces of evidence before the authorities come. If we can expect this to happen, and we've already located an elevator where they would come up from, we could set an ambush and attack them. 
Luring the supervisors up is a lot better than us going down into their territory, and if we can capture one, we'll have access to the information we need to escape with our lives. Meanwhile, in the surveillance room, the supervisors are panicking. They don't know where the survivors went, but that's when this man finds the college students on the camera feeds inside the facility. The supervisor orders his men to finish them off, but instructs them to make sure that Marty is taken out first. Inside the elevator, the door suddenly opens and a guard comes in, pointing his gun at the survivors. He orders Dana to step out immediately, but the zombie's chopped off arm grabs his leg, distracting him. Seizing the opportunity, the friend shoved the man against the wall, and he falls to the floor. Marty takes the guard's gun along with the zombie's knife, and together, they walk out of the elevator. That's when they hear footsteps marching towards them, and realize guards have been sent to hunt them down. They run into one of the control rooms, taking cover inside from the gunmen who start firing at them. Dana here notices a red button labeled System Purge, and slams it down, dooming everyone in the building. The guards stop firing as they hear something coming up behind the elevator doors, and the monsters suddenly come out to attack them. The whole facility goes on red alert, and more creatures escape their cells to hunt down their captors. That's when a monster bat crashes through the window, and the students run out of there as fast as they can. They find their exit blocked by a horde of zombies, and they have no choice but to climb into a hole in the wall, finding that it leads them into this massive underground chamber. Against the walls are these tablets, each with a unique figure on it, and Dano realizes the characters represent everyone who went to the cabin. It must mean the people running the secret operation wanted them to die as part of a ritual, and that's when this woman suddenly enters the room, taking the students by surprise. She explains the tablets represent five different roles, the whore, the athlete, the scholar, the fool, and the virgin. Each person assigned to these roles must be killed in that specific order by monsters, but the virgin is the only victim who is allowed to live. Dana realizes that must be her role, and Marty asks what will happen if they aren't killed. She explains the world will be destroyed by creatures called the Ancient Ones, but all the other rituals their organization set up have already failed. The room suddenly starts shaking as the woman desperately tells Marty that he needs to die or else the entire human race will be destroyed. And realizing what's at stake, Dana raises the gun at her friend. Turning around, Marty can't believe she would betray him, and the girl is about to pull the trigger when a werewolf suddenly attacks her from behind. She drops the gun to the floor, and Marty dives at the weapon. He wrestles with the lady for the gun, taking it out of her grip, and shoots the werewolf, scaring the creature away. That's when the woman attacks him, knocking Marty to the ground, and the two fight over the gun. She's about to finish him off, but suddenly a zombie swings an axe straight into her skull, killing her. Seeing his opportunity, Marty here kicks the dead body off the platform and dooms the entire planet. With the end of the world approaching, the two friends sit and wait as the facility collapses around them and the Ancient Ones wake up. That's now 7.9 billion down with no more to go. But what do you think? How would you beat Cabin in the Woods? Let me know with a comment, and thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Please check them out at the link below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How to Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.